She was New York's infamous realtor to the stars. She didn't just want to be Linda Stein. She wanted to be Linda Stein in all capital letters. And that's what she was. She had a certain style for a certain era until her trademark toughness earned her a dangerous enemy. My mom is in a puddle of blood. Can you help me? There were blunt force trauma wounds on her head. The investigation into her death would take police behind the closed doors of New York's elite into a world of entertainment, power, and betrayal. You know those Agatha Christie stories where a person gets killed and it turns out that everybody in the room had a motive? That's what this case was like. As I was always told, you never rule anybody out as a suspect. Tuesday, October 30th, 2007. It's the night before Halloween in one of New York City's most affluent neighborhoods. But for one family, a nightmare is unfolding. Just before 10.30 p.m., police receive an emergency call from a frantic young woman. Oh, my God, please. Please separate at 1142 with your emergency. Hello? Please, I need an ambulance. Okay, what happened then, ma'am? Uh, my mom, she's dead, I think. She said she came home and found her mother lying in a pool of blood at the bottom of the stairs. She had no idea what had happened. Officers are immediately dispatched to the location, a penthouse apartment on the Upper East Side. As soon as they get there, they can see the victim is dead. No pulse, no breathing. But it's hard to tell what had happened because she's wearing some sort of sweatshirt hoodie and it's covering her head. There was a pool of blood on the floor, which could indicate a couple of things. In our training, we're not allowed to touch the body, so we have to actually wait for the medical examiner. Somebody could make the assumption that she possibly could have slipped and fell and banged her head. But a closer look reveals that this was no accident. That was all pretty much put to rest when they realized there were holes in the top of the hood because of multiple blunt force injuries. This woman did not fall. Someone beat her to death. Somebody being bludgeoned to death and their body left bloody in their own apartment. That just doesn't happen on Fifth Avenue. And the identity of the victim was even more surprising. One of New York's most notable celebrities, 62-year-old Linda Stein. Everybody knew who Linda Stein was. She was sort of like one of the main characters in the ongoing soap opera that is New York City. You get these stories in New York of a certain period in the late 60s and early 70s of scrappy outer borough people who come into New York and seek their fortune, usually in entertainment. I'm talking about people like Neil Diamond or Carol King or Phil Spector. Well, Linda Stein was one of those people. The daughter of a kosher caterer, Linda was born in Manhattan, but raised in the Bronx. It's really basically the suburbs. And she had a very reasonable, middle-class, Jewish, ordinary, kind of boring life. After high school, Linda seemed content to stay close to home. In her 20s, she was teaching grade school in the Bronx, but that didn't last for long. In the late 60s, Linda's life took an unexpected turn when she met Seymour Stein, an up-and-coming music producer whose niece was in Linda's class. Seymour Stein's record label was Sire Records, uh, one of the most progressive labels of its time. It still exists. They hit it off right away and began dating. Seymour introduced her to the New York music scene and she absolutely loved it. It didn't take long for her to quit her job as a school teacher. She went off to Manhattan and her life changed completely. She embraced rock and roll. She embraced the counterculture. She joined the underground at a time when the underground was the coolest thing, not just in New York, but in the whole world. Andy Warhol, the works, she was a big part of it. In 1971, 26-year-old Linda and 29-year-old Seymour decided to become partners, both in life and in business. Seymour's considered a musical guru. 
he discovered so many bands. Depeche Mode, he signed Madonna. I mean, just the list goes on and on and on. They were two people from the neighborhood who had made it and become super cool in the coolest place in the world. And now they were married and a force to contend with. She started to accomplish things by herself. With her friend Danny Fields, she discovered the Ramones. Linda brought them all around the world and turned them into the biggest underground music act of the 70s. In addition to their music careers, Linda and Seymour had two daughters, Mandy and Samantha. But unfortunately, their marriage wouldn't last. The best way I could probably describe the marriage between Seymour Stein and Linda Stein is that it was kind of a 70s marriage, that even while they were married, they had extracurricular activities, that they raised a family together and remained devoted to their children, but that the marriage itself was kind of tenuous and elastic from the beginning. Linda and Seymour split in 1979, and though they remained friends, it wasn't exactly an easy divorce. It took something like 12 years for the divorce to go through, maybe because they were being combative with one another, but this wasn't a War of the Roses situation where they were tormenting one another. They also were raising daughters, and in fact, Seymour was actually helping Linda out in her business. After the breakup, Linda decided to launch a new career, this time in real estate. We met when I worked at Studio 54. As a realtor, connections are paramount. They're the most important thing, especially in a city like New York. And Linda knew everyone. Madonna, Sting, Billy Joel, Christy Brinkley, and the list goes on and on. Linda worked so many high-profile deals that in the 80s, she eventually became known as the real estate agent to the stars. She was also regularly featured in the gossip columns. She was in page six eight times in one year. She didn't just want to be Linda Stein. She wanted to be Linda Stein in all capital letters. And that's what she was in, in the 80s. Linda was kind enough after I got my license to take me on under her wing. With her brash style and fierce determination, Linda once again rose to fame and fortune. But her greatest challenge was yet to come in her late 40s. In the early 90s, Linda was diagnosed with breast cancer and went through two radical mastectomies. Linda was so determined to overcome any adversity. Very sweet in a lot of ways, but she was the toughest woman. She was cancer, gonna beat cancer. Linda survived breast cancer, but in 2005, doctors discovered a benign brain tumor that started causing more health problems. But any hope Linda might have had for a full recovery is now over. Instead, she's become the victim of a brutal attack, and investigators want to know why. She was brassy and confrontational with everyone. Those of us in the media were saying, well, this is Linda Stein. Who did she annoy? Who did she betray at the office? Or a lover, maybe, who she spurned? Maybe a rival real estate broker? You know, anything went in terms of the suspect list because this was Linda. Coming up, the list of enemies turns out to be longer than anyone expected. Even the people who loved her the most said that she was a verbally abusive person. Detectives in New York City are investigating the murder of 62-year-old celebrity real estate broker Linda Stein. Their only witness is Linda's daughter, Mandy, who found her body and called 911. Mandy was a documentary filmmaker in Los Angeles, but she had been staying with her mother in New York while she was working on a film. She told police she had come home around 10.30 p.m. Mandy shows up at the penthouse apartment on Fifth Avenue. She goes upstairs. She goes into the apartment, and she sees her mother lying face down in the living room with her sweatshirt pulled over her head. Mandy did state that she found her mother not breathing and there was blood on the floor. She said she last spoke to her earlier in the day. Mandy Stein was very helpful in the investigation, giving us information of who was in Linda's life. But it took some time to get that information. She was very, very upset. As Mandy speaks to detectives, the medical examiner arrives to confirm the cause of death. She started going over the body. She removed the hoodie over the head. 
Once she started, she noticed that there were lacerations on top of the head. They were ruling Linda Stein's death a homicide by blunt force trauma. It's not like she has one cut and she hit her head or something. There's multiple cuts on the back of her head. Blows from the back of the head. That is a, a possibility that was a surprise that that happened. She was bludgeoned, hit maybe six or seven times, police said, with some sort of heavy object. While Linda's body is removed for an autopsy, investigators begin searching for the murder weapon. We now know we're looking for some type of blunt object that could cause the injuries that killed her. We didn't have the murder weapon at all in the apartment. Our crime scene looked for it. They couldn't find anything. We also don't know exactly what we're looking for yet until we get to the autopsy. However, police do find several other clues. The fact that she had the hood over her head. I mean, in other cases, we were always taught that when somebody covers the face, it's usually because that person knows that person. There had been no forced entry and no sign of a struggle, so it appeared she let her attacker in. Usually when a sign of a struggle, you know, you would see like chairs knocked down, this knocked down, something broken. We really didn't see that somebody was in the apartment with her when this happened. It didn't apparently look like a robbery, so why would somebody kill this woman? I got a call from Linda's daughters, um, Samantha and Mandy, very early uh, Halloween morning. And I think it was um, Mandy who said to me, Mommy's dead. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? was completely incredible. You know, mommy is dead, mommy is dead. Widening their search, detectives canvassed the building in the hopes that one of the residents might have seen or heard something. The neighbors were shaken because it's such a nice neighborhood. And on top of that, the building is completely secure. Pretty much nobody makes a move without knowing who came in. Fifth Avenue in New York is probably everybody's last guess at where uh, an unspeakable violent crime would take place. Unfortunately, no one describes seeing anything out of the ordinary. No one in the building they didn't recognize, no strange deliveries, nothing like that. However, investigators do learn that there is a long list of people who disliked Linda. We spoke to a number of employees of the building that would say that Miss Stein could be an abrupt person, sometimes have a nasty attitude towards people, and that made people feel uncomfortable. Even the people who loved her the most said that she was a verbally abusive person, said that she could be cruel to them all the time. Linda was a tough cookie. She had a certain style for a certain era. Linda could definitely, as much as I loved her, could definitely rub people the wrong way. She had a mouth, as they say. <laughs> In fact, police discover that Linda recently clashed with some of the construction workers who were renovating the building. They were putting a new roof on the building. There may have been as many as 30, 40 construction workers uh, that were in and out all day. The crew was working directly above Linda's penthouse apartment. She often complained about the noise, and she had a shouting match with some of the workers who one day showed up at her door unannounced. They got off the wrong floor. They knocked on the door. She felt, you know, they shouldn't even be there. Could Linda have pushed one of them too far? What we were learning is that they felt that Linda was mean to them. She would always curse them out because they were making so much noise. We were told that she would call them names. She would tell them to get the F out of here, stop making a racket. It was almost a daily thing. One thing that people were saying after Linda Stein died is maybe she finally ticked off the wrong person. Coming up, the list of suspects continues to grow. As I was always told, you'd never rule anybody out as a suspect. It's been several hours since celebrity real estate agent Linda Stein was found beaten to death in her penthouse apartment, and detectives have no shortage of potential suspects. You know those Agatha Christie stories where a person gets killed and it turns out that everybody in the room had a motive? Well, that's what this case was like, only the room was the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and the real estate business and the rock and roll business. 
At one point or another, this particular victim had made enemies of everybody in all of those worlds. We interviewed many people that are employed at the building, service-oriented people that did say that Linda Stein can be abrupt, can be nasty in the way she talks to people at times, and, you know, avoided it. Investigators are particularly interested in speaking to a group of construction workers Linda argued with several days before. It wasn't considered a manhunt looking for a individual because we had just so much to do with the people at the building. We had enough to do without saying we're going to be looking for a certain individual. We had to go through everybody first. We spoke to the elevator operator. We spoke to the super. Police found out that construction workers used a back service elevator and could only gain access to the apartments by a back door, and even then, the superintendent had to let them in. But when investigators check Linda's apartment, they find the service door bolted shut. The door was actually locked from the inside. There's only one key, and then you have the deadbolt, which there's no key for from the outside. When police tracked down all of the construction workers who had been working in the building that day, they all said none of them had ever even been inside Linda's apartment. From the interviews that were done, nobody could establish a motive that one of the workers were involved in killing Linda Stein. With the construction workers cleared, investigators turned their attention to who else was in the building that day. We started watching the surveillance footage once we established that it was a homicide, we did go with the super, and the super let us view the video. Since the elevator operator was able to identify everyone who came in and out of the building that day, he was able to help narrow down the search quite a bit. We spoke to him in regards to, besides Mandy, who came out before. He said it was only one other person who came in a couple times during the day, and that was uh, Natavia Lowry. Detectives learned that 26-year-old Natavia Lowry is Linda's personal assistant, hired by the real estate company Linda worked for. They hired a temp agency to help them procure personal assistance for some of their top brokers. If you did a certain amount of money, which Linda always certainly did, you were actually entitled to have an assistant that they would pay for. Of course police were going to want to talk to her because... She had access in and out of the building, and most likely she was the last person to see Linda alive. When I first met Atavia, she was surprised about hearing this news that her boss was uh, murdered. She seemed upset, but she wasn't weeping. She was a very attractive young lady. She was a graduate of North Carolina State. She was very intelligent. She aspired, I believe, to be an actress. On the face of it, they may not have had a lot in common. An established celebrity real estate broker and a young woman who really has absolutely no job history or no career to speak of and comes from nowhere, from a mile away from Williamsburg out in Brooklyn. But on the other hand, they both are outsiders who have come into Manhattan. And it's just that Linda's a little further along the track. According to Natavia, working for Linda was often challenging, but always rewarding. She could be rude to some of the workers. She had witnessed that. But uh, overall, she got along with that. She told me uh, it, was a, it was tough, but she was learning a lot. It was not your typical business assistant job. It was almost like a home health aid job combined with clerical work and phone answering. According to Natavia, Linda smoked a lot of marijuana in order to deal with the pain. And she also required a lot of assistance. She's slowing down, but, you know, you, you can see when somebody has something major like a brain tumor, it affects them. She would set up Linda's appointments, do saw a lot of her bill paying, a lot of her financial stuff for the short time she was there. She would also do things like uh, get her lunch, do her makeup, anything that she would need. Investigators are particularly interested to know what she and Linda were both doing that day. Natavia said she had shown up at the apartment to take care of the normal chores. But like so many mornings, Linda wanted to take a power walk. Natavia indicated that at uh, some point during the day, Linda was going to go out and do one of those uh, fast-paced walks. I did her makeup, and I left the building a couple times to go to the office to get some supplies. 
When police asked Natavia how she got to work every day, she said she always walked, less for the exercise and more to save money. She said she expected to see Linda at the office later that day, but she didn't. She left Linda a long voicemail, a very routine, run-of-the-mill, ho-hum, hi, you know, but making it clear that she wasn't there, that she didn't see Linda, that Linda was out somewhere, and that she would see her tomorrow. When detectives ask her if she knows of anyone who might want to hurt Linda, Natavia tells them about a former lover. Raul, at age 49, was nearly 15 years younger than Linda. He started out as her protege, but in 2005, their relationship took a romantic turn. I remember staying at the house a couple of weekends in the Hamptons. Raul came to stay with Linda. He seemed to genuinely really like her a lot, yeah, that that I could see. But according to Natavia, Linda had broken up with Raul when she discovered he was using her. He wasn't as into her as she was into him. In fact, he wanted her for her business contacts. The New York real estate industry is incredibly cutthroat. You're dealing with apartments and commissions that run into the millions and millions of dollars just for being someone's agent or just for selling an apartment. It makes you wonder if he wanted payback for Linda cutting him out of her life. Did he want to become the realtor to the stars? Coming up, the surveillance tapes lead to a startling revelation. She noticed something that nobody else picked up on, a reflection in the glass. On November 2nd, 2007, Linda Stein is laid to rest. Among the mourners are some of New York's biggest celebrities. It wasn't just celebrities. All of her family and friends and co-workers from the real estate agency were there as well. The thing that I remember most of all is standing in the back in the doorway crying was Natavia Lowry. It was wrenching, really, because this was an open murder case. And nobody knew who did it. And her daughters both spoke. One spoke tearfully. The other spoke with rage about trying to find out who had done this to their mother. Linda's ex-husband, Seymour Stein, also spoke at the funeral and gave a very powerful eulogy. He was very emotional. He was in disbelief that something like this could happen. And this is years after they had been married. Linda's ex-husband and their two daughters are all cleared. Detective's best remaining suspect seems to be one of Linda's former lovers, Raul, who Linda had broken up with a year prior to the murder. If he was dating Linda only for her contacts in the real estate agency, then he lost his best chance at success when Linda broke up with him. But unfortunately, he didn't pan out as a suspect either. I did interview Raul. He was eventually ruled out. He could account for his time. I could account that he wasn't in and out of the building that day based on the video surveillance. So, yes, he was one of the few personal friends that we spoke to that we ruled out as soon as we spoke to him. At that point, police were pretty much back at square one. So they went back to the security footage from the building, hoping they had missed something. Different detectives were watching 24 hours of video from five or six different cameras, 24 hours of sitting there watching. It takes time. It's tiresome. While that was going on, a forensics team went through every inch of Linda's penthouse apartment looking for clues. They did major surgery on that apartment. They were pulling door jams off the walls, and they went into the bathroom, and they pulled the entire basin going down into the drain to see if maybe somebody had left a hair or skin cells or anything that might connect Linda to someone else at the time of her death. Despite the massive effort, the team comes up empty-handed. But a few days later, police finally catch a break, thanks to one sharp-eyed investigator. She was looking at the video, and she noticed something that nobody else picked up on. The front glass door was opened by the doorman. And as it opened, it caught a reflection in the glass of Natavia getting out of a cab holding money in her hand. That was something that immediately stuck out to police because it contradicted part of her earlier statement. Discrepancy in her 
two prior statements was picked up. She had told us that she always walked wherever she went when she left the building that day of the murder, based upon what we saw on video. And it was the first time we were able to say, she's not telling us the truth about something. If Natavia had been caught on tape lying about taking a cab back to Linda's apartment that day, what else could she be lying about? When the autopsy report comes in, it contradicts another part of Natavia's story. She had stated that she put makeup on Linda before Linda left to walk to work. We had learned that her body was examined by the medical examiner's office and there were no traces of makeup on Linda that day. If it's just one of these things, you might think that she either misspoke or didn't remember correctly, but taken together, this was a major red flag. If people lie about the little things, there is potential that they could be lying about the bigger things. Everything needs to be investigated. On November 8th, 2007, nine days after Linda's murder, detectives sit down with Natavia for another interview. During the interview, we asked her about being truthful, about where she went when she left the building. A bubbly demeanor started to diminish. She started to get upset when we started asking her about where she'd been. We know you weren't walking to work. We know you got into a car. We know it was a cab. Instead of answering, she'd ask for bathroom breaks. When she came back from the bathroom, she seemed much calmer. Detectives later learned she had used that time and used her phone to text her boyfriend in Virginia. They were talking about how much they loved each other. I uh, can't wait to see you. It's kind of interesting that that's what she would choose to do in the middle of an interview. But so be it. Since Natavia doesn't seem to be taking their questions seriously, investigators decide to turn up the heat. She started changing her story about the first interview she gave me. She started getting emotional. Natavia finally decided to come clean and tell police exactly what happened that night. And it was one hell of a story. Coming up, an unreliable witness becomes the prime suspect. I was mad. I was confused. I was angry. A little more than a week after Linda Stein was found brutally murdered, investigators have a suspect in custody. Linda's personal assistant, Natavia Lowry. She was close to Linda. It was known that she was one of the last people, if not the last person, to see Linda alive. When police hit her with all of the discrepancies in her story, she got very upset and said she would finally tell them exactly what happened. But what Natavia tells detectives sounds more like a bad dream than reality. She started talking about how ninjas came up through the back entrance. According to Natavia, she and Linda were in the apartment alone when a masked man burst in with a hammer and began attacking them. Told her they were going to harm her and her family if she said anything, and they killed Miss Stein. It was kind of an unbelievable story. It's tough to take in. Not only does Natavia's story about a killer ninja appear ridiculous, it's actually impossible because of all of the building's security cameras. We tried getting detectives into the building unseen by every entrance, and they got picked up on tape at some point in time. It's impossible to get into the building without being caught on tape. We pretty much told us, listen, no ninja came in. However... Their skepticism doesn't stop Natavia from concocting another tall tale. She said sometimes she would black out and then she would wake up and be in these crazy rages. Listen, detectives, it's happened to me once before. It happened in college. I blacked out and when I woke up, I was told that I was choking my roommate. So her story became, I didn't do anything to Linda, but if I did, I couldn't really remember because of all of these blackouts that I had. You probably would have told us earlier on if you blacked out of a medical condition. He says, that didn't happen. You know, it's the first time we're hearing about this. Faced with murder charges, Natavia decides to try one last version of events. The truth. 
There were no ninjas or blackouts this time, but she killed Linda out of self-defense. Linda Stein, who we all know, could be tough on people, was especially tough on her. Not just garden variety tough, but like racist tough. And that she couldn't take it anymore, and that she somehow snapped, and that this was an impulsive act and not a premeditated act. Natavia writes a signed confession, which she repeats for the district attorney on camera. I was mad. I was confused. I was angry, paranoid. It was like a feeling like I never had before. It was like, it felt like she was like my worst enemy, you know? Natavia claimed that Linda lashed out at her that morning, both physically and emotionally. She said that she felt demeaned by Miss Stein. She was blowing marijuana smoke in her face. It's like, I don't let her buy my lunch, you know? I buy my lunch, you know? And so she was like, hmm, that's the first I hear somebody black saving their money, right? So she's pointing the cane at me now. Right? So she just looks crazy right now. Her hand is, you know, going like that. And then she had like her, um, it's like a wooden baton type thing. Natavia described the baton as a stick that Linda used to help her with yoga stretches. It was like a cane, but without the handle, and Linda was swinging at her with it. I sit on the couch. So. She's like waving a cane and stuff at me. Then it's like, I don't know, like after that remark and stuff and, you know, her screaming and yelling, I just snatched it from her. I saw her took it and it's like, I just hit her with it. She said that she snapped, that this was an emotional act because she had been so terribly abused by Linda because Linda had blown pot smoke in her face, because Linda had made racial remarks against her. She said she just lost it. She just lost it. And once Natavia started hitting Linda, she couldn't stop. And I did it, like, a couple more times. On her head. After the first time she fell. And then you continued to hit her on the head with the stick? Yes. You know how many times you hit her? I wasn't myself. I don't... I can't count. The statement that we just taken puts the weapon in our hand, killing Miss Stein. On November 9th, 2007, 10 days after Linda was murdered, Natavia Lowry is arrested and charged with second-degree murder. By the time we took her out of the precinct, it was probably like 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. I thought back to seeing her there at the funeral, standing there in the back, crying. She wanted to be an actress. She was doing a great job up to a certain point. But we're better. Coming up, what appears to be an open-and-shut case is suddenly cast into doubt. Miss Lowry's confession should have never been obtained that way. On November 9, 2007, Natavia Lowry is arraigned for the murder of her employer, 62-year-old celebrity real estate agent Linda Stein. The judge orders her to be held without bail, but Natavia's lawyers have other ideas. They claimed her confession was taken illegally and therefore should be inadmissible. Detectives decided to take her statement regardless of the fact that they knew she was represented by an attorney. Miss Lowry's confession should have never been obtained that way. So when we shut her down, first thing we did was, do you have a lawyer or not? because I'm going to read you your Miranda warnings. And I don't want any confusion about if you're represented by a lawyer. Because if you're represented by a lawyer, we can't talk anymore. And she waved her Miranda warnings, and we started interviewing her. The judge agrees, 
ruling that Natavia's taped confession could be used during trial. But there was more bad news to come. That was already a big blow to the defense, but prosecutors got even more when they got a hold of Linda's financial records. A financial forensic analysis revealed a pattern of deception. Natavia had looted tens of thousands of dollars from Linda practically from the day she began working for her. We know that Natavia stole approximately $30,000 while employed. Those financial records are admitted into evidence when the trial begins in January of 2010, over two years after Linda's murder. Linda's loved ones testify that she voiced her concern to them sometime prior to her death. She said to me, what would you do if you found out someone was stealing from you? I said, well, I would certainly look into it. Then Linda said to me, I need to talk to this person about what's going on, you know, and be upfront about it, which I felt Linda wouldn't have any problem doing. <laughs> you know, so. The prosecution's theory was that Linda actually confronted Natavia about stealing the money, and that was the reason why Natavia killed her. To convince the jury, prosecutors play the entire 90-minute confession in which Natavia changes her story several times before describing the murder in detail. I just snatched it from her to my side, took it, and it's like, I just hit her with it. In the video, Natavia claims Linda provoked her by blowing marijuana smoke in her face. But the autopsy report indicated that was yet another lie. Toxicology results came back that there was no marijuana in the system. Prosecutors argue that Natavia's own actions prove that she didn't snap as she claimed. She knew exactly what she was doing and tried to cover it up. She pulled the sweatshirt over Linda's face, but then she took a phone call and said that Linda wasn't there and would be right back. And then she went to an ATM and took $800 out of Linda's account. The surveillance video shows Natavia arriving for work just before noon and then leaving at 1.19 p.m. with a full shopping bag. The prosecutor suggests it could have contained the murder weapon, which was never found. Miss Lowey showed up to work wearing parachute sweatpants. When she left the building, captured on video, she had the same pants on, but the baggy pockets from the parachute pants were no longer there. It was believed that she was wearing her pants inside out. The implication was that Natavia had Linda's blood on her pants, and that's why she turned them inside out. But as the defense pointed out, they didn't have the pants or any other physical evidence to connect her to the crime. After a month-long trial, Natavia's fate rests in the hands of the jury. They deliberate for only five hours before reaching a verdict. Natavia Lowry is found guilty, murder, second degree. And the judge gave her 25 to life for the murder and additional time for the larcenies uh, related to it. And she is not eligible for parole until 27 years. While no verdict or sentence will ever bring our mother, Linda Stein, back to us, we are extremely satisfied with the decision, I'm relieved for society that that woman will never be on the street. It seemed justice had been served. But was Linda's murder an act of revenge by an abused employee or simply the result of a young woman's greed? I feel there are really two ways of looking at this case. Either the suspect was seeking revenge because her boss had been so horrible to her or the suspect had been looking to con her boss all along and was unstable and snapped and ended up killing her. Trying to get the job done with not enough knowledge of the theft that was going on, uh, trying to dance around it. She almost pulled it off. I miss my friend. I miss her directness. I mean, I love that about Linda, you know, that she was direct, you know. She was a real New York character. You know, but she was also a very loving person. I was fortunate enough to, to see that side of her.
They were two gifted doctors working on a cure for cancer. He had sterling academics and was having a successful career in his chosen field. She chose to be an oncologist because several family members were touched by cancer. But a mysterious illness would bring their collaboration to a sudden end. He was going into kidney failure. Several of his organs were starting to fail. This was a medical mystery. They were testing for everything under the sun. The subsequent investigation would expose a chilling cause and a love triangle gone wrong. This was a case about jealousy and fatal attraction gone awry. This wasn't just a woman scorned. This was a woman scorched. January 27, 2013, Houston, Texas. It's nearly midnight when a man is brought into the emergency room of the MD Anderson Cancer Center at the University of Texas. This is a world-renowned cancer hospital. They don't have a lot of walk-ins at their emergency room. He wasn't making a whole lot of sense. He was of an altered state of mind. The ER physicians are having a difficult time figuring out who he is and what's wrong with him. Luckily, two women that appear shortly after he arrived helped. One of them was his longtime living girlfriend, Yvette Tony, and the other was his research partner, Dr. Anna Gonzalez Angulo. The two women identify him as Dr. George Blumenshine, a member of staff at the University Center. Turns out he's a very prominent cancer researcher at this hospital at MD Anderson. The doctors immediately admitted him to run a series of tests to figure out what was wrong. They thought maybe he was having a stroke. They did various uh, neurological tests. The tests are all negative. Meanwhile, Dr. Blumenshine's condition continues to worsen. The lab work showed an unusual high level of acid in his blood, which was causing kidney damage. He was immediately transferred to intensive care. He was going into kidney failure. Uh, several of his organs were starting to fail, so he was in grave condition. They're just trying to sort out exactly what's going on and don't really have a clue. By the time the mystery is solved, it will no longer be just a medical problem, but a matter for police as well. Forty-eight-year-old George Blumenshine had been following in his family's footsteps when he first entered the medical profession. He comes from a family where his father was a, a renowned doctor himself, uh, who known the world over. So he kind of grew up around high-profile doctor community. Got his BA from Vanderbilt. He got his medical degree from University of Texas Medical School here in Houston and ended up going into cancer research and uh, studied uh, cancers of the neck and the throat. After medical school, George decided to stay in Houston to pursue his career. For the type of research George was doing, he could not have picked a better place. The Texas Medical Center complex is the largest of its kind in the world. MD Anderson is a premier cancer institution. It is a hospital and teaching center that uh, really is focused on ending cancer. It is a place where people come from all over the world to be treated because they have the cutting edge and it gives you the best chance at life. But professional success wasn't the only thing he found there. In 2003, George fell in love with a fellow doctor named Yvette Tony. Dr. Yvette Tony was an epidemiologist. She's a highly educated person herself, just a different side of the medical field. They had a lot in common. She was just as brilliant and accomplished as he was. So they hit it off really well. They seemed to grow even closer over the years. 2007 was an important year for them. Yvette landed her dream job with a pharmaceutical company, and they decided to move in together. Although they were never married, in 2012, George and Yvette made a different life decision. They wanted to take the next step, and that next step for them was to try to have a child. 
Normally, there would be nothing wrong with that, but Yvette did face challenges getting pregnant. They were both in their late 40s, so it was a little late to have a child. So, you know, they tried to use IVF. There's, you know, various procedures that Yvette had to go through in their quest to have a child. Their persistence seemed to pay off. In May of 2012, Yvette learned she was pregnant with twins, but it would end in heartbreak. Yvette Tony suffered a miscarriage, and when that happened, that was devastating for both Dr. Blumenshine and Yvette Tony. They were still trying to recover from that loss. It's a very difficult thing for any couple to get over. Now, just four months later, George has been admitted to intensive care, and the couple is dealing with another life-threatening medical emergency. Dr. George Blumenshine was taken to the emergency center in the late evening. He was in critical condition. Once your kidneys go, you know, things start shutting down pretty fast, and they realize that he is probably going to die, so they put him on dialysis. They could not figure out what was wrong with Dr. Blumenshine until it was almost too late. The next day, there is finally a breakthrough. A nurse was changing his urine bag when she noticed that there was this white sediment in the urine. So she sent it over to a kidney specialist for testing. He took it to his lab and put a sample under the microscope. And he realized, uh, you know, he, he could see crystals. And he was amazed because he knew what that meant. Coming up, a mysterious illness becomes a criminal investigation. It just didn't make any sense because either he drank it himself or was poisoned, which is just too far-fetched to believe. Dr. George Blumenshine, a 48-year-old cancer researcher, has been admitted to intensive care after his kidneys mysteriously began shutting down. And after a battery of tests, doctors have isolated the cause. It wasn't until the nephrologist, the kidney doctor, looked under the microscope and saw these calcium oxalate crystals and thought, oh my goodness, this is what's going on. He has been poisoned. Because there are not really very many things that can cause calcium oxalate crystals in the urine. It's a telltale sign of ethylene glycol poisoning, which is consistent with his other symptoms. Those symptoms include intoxication, stomach pain, and kidney failure. You can die from ingesting even a small amount. And it just didn't make any sense because this is basically antifreeze. An adult doesn't drink it, much less, you know, a, a world-renowned doctor. The hospital immediately notifies police. Investigator Max Sosa is assigned to the case. I made my way over to intensive care where he was located. He wasn't able to be responsive to any type of questioning. It was just his, his, his physical condition. What normally kills somebody in ethylene glycol poisoning is not just the kidney failure, but... It is the metabolic derangements that occur. Death can occur from a life-threatening heart rhythm and arrhythmia. Because of the circumstances of not knowing what we had, it was real touch and go. With George out of commission, the next step is to talk to those closest to him. The detective begins with George's longtime girlfriend, Yvette Tony. Since it looked like a poisoning case, you know, the authorities wanted to know what he had eaten and what he had drank. When I initially met Yvette Tony, she was uh, very nice. She appeared to be forthcoming. We tried to get a time frame of when they had eaten together. Yvette says she has no idea how he could have been poisoned. They'd shared a meal just the night before when George returned from a medical conference. They had uh, gotten takeout from a, a well-known Greek restaurant here in Houston drank a bottle of wine, and went to bed, everything seemed fine. She showed no symptoms that were anything similar to what George Blumenshine was experiencing. So 
That led me to believe that I could possibly rule out uh, anything that they had consumed or drank together. That morning, George had left for work, even though it was a weekend. You know, he got up, drank a glass of orange juice, and then went out the door to, to go work with uh, Dr. Gonzalez Angulo. They had been working together long hours on a project, a research paper. There was no signs that there was anything wrong with him. There was no slurring of his speech. Nothing was wrong with, the, with his gait. He just appeared to be normal. But Yvette says that when she called George later that day, something didn't seem right. She said that the first time that she spoke with him, it was somewhere around noon, one o'clock, and um, he was complaining of his head hurting. The second time that she talked to him, she indicated that she could al already hear a slur in his speech at that point. She was concerned that he was displaying symptoms of possibly having a stroke. Some time goes by and she still hasn't heard from him, so she starts to get worried. She tried calling him several times in the next few hours, but he never picked up. Yvette tells police that George was scheduled to have a dinner meeting that night with several other physicians, including Dr. Anna Gonzalez Angulo. So around 10 p.m., she finally tried contacting Anna at home. Yvette was able to reach uh, Dr. Gonzalez Angulo on her phone and ask what the heck was going on. And Dr. Gonzalez Angulo said, I think it's fine. Uh, George is acting weird, though. Yvette Tony, she's asking what condition he's in and uh, why hasn't he gone to the doctor yet. Dr. Gonzalez Angulo's response was that George was uncontrollable. She wasn't able to convince him to go to the doctor. Yvette tells Dr. Gonzalez Angulo, stay there, I'm coming to get him and I'll take him to the hospital. But Yvette says that by the time she arrived at Anna's home, George had already left. George was driving himself to the hospital. The reaction that Yvette Tony had at that point was she just couldn't understand how Dr. Gonzalez Angulo allowed him to drive his vehicle in the condition that he was in. Apparently, he just took the keys and left. There wasn't much she could do to stop him. So Anna and Yvette both drive over to MD Anderson, where they find George sitting on a bench. He basically had driven himself to the parking garage where he normally parked. They were trying to urge him to get to the hospital, and he was reluctant. His speech was slurred. He was incoherent. To convince George he needed help, Yvette recorded him slurring on her phone while she and Anna talked to him. He's trying to act normal, like nothing's wrong, and he just looks like a drone. She takes it for, you know, her own edification to show him later, this is why I made you go. Why don't you stand up and introduce yourself? Last eight hours or so, I've gotten progressively um, discordant. His speech, his reaction, his movements, it all appeared that he wasn't understanding at all what was going on. They actually had to call emergency center personnel to come and get him. George, Josiah, how are you doing? Sure. How are you? I'm fine. I think you're fine. Just let me make sure you're here. Yeah, let's go hydrate you. More than eight hours after his symptoms first appeared, George was finally admitted to the ER. But was it already too late? Uh, what was difficult in not being able to talk to the victim was he was the one who knew who he was in contact with, what he had eaten, what he had drank. Uh, without any of that information available to us, it was a delay in leading us to where we needed to go. Maybe it was a patient that was upset and going after doctors at MD Anderson, somebody that didn't get cured and, and was going to die anyway. It was just such a, a an unbelievable crime to poison somebody with, you know, such a coarse substance. Coming up, hospital rumors lead to a surprising new suspect. It seemed to be the worst kept secret at the hospital. It has been several hours since Dr. George Blumenshine was diagnosed with severe chemical poisoning, and investigators are trying to determine who could have done it. 
the actual chemical that was used with acetylene glycol. That's commonly known to be used in antifreeze. However, it was used in its pure form, and that is commonly used in laboratories. It seemed very unlikely that an experienced doctor would accidentally ingest it, and it just so happens that Dr. Bloomishine didn't even work in a lab. Did that mean the suspect might be working at the hospital? We looked at the possibility of someone eliminating somebody just so they could take credit for the research. We looked into every possibility, but every possibility was not a probability. Meanwhile, George continues to fight for his life. He was so sick, he was near death. The investigation has only just begun when it hits an unexpected roadblock. George's girlfriend, Yvette Tony, has been helpful to detectives so far. But now, she suddenly seems to have a change of heart. She indicated that she was going to have to uh, confer with an attorney. It was surprising because that was going to hinder our process in the investigation. Was she being protective or was she trying to hide something? Yvette Tony was absolutely a suspect. We did not rule out or rule in anyone until we had all the facts. And when police try to interview George's research partner, Dr. Anna Gonzalez Angulo, they find her equally evasive. When trying to even make contact, even in a phone call, it was very difficult. It took uh, several days before I was able to arrange a meeting with her. Could both women have something to hide? Hoping to find answers, detectives turn to George's colleagues, and what they learn is surprising. The other doctors say that he's a well-respected member of the faculty. They have no idea who will want to harm him, but he does have a secret. This was a guy who was having an affair, who had kept it from his long-term live-in girlfriend with whom he was trying to have a child who was engaged in a relationship with Dr. Gonzalez. At age 41, Dr. Anna Gonzalez Angulo had come a long way from her humble beginnings. Dr. Gonzalez was born and grew up in Popayan, Colombia. Her parents had uh, three children. They grew up on a ranch, producers of coffee and fruit and cattle. So it's a hardworking family. Like George, she decided to go into medicine because of her family members. She chose specifically to be an oncologist because several family members were touched by cancer. After medical school in Columbia and a residency in Florida, Anna landed at MD Anderson in 2003. She quickly rose to be one of the hospital's shining stars. Dr. Gonzalez Angulo was world-renowned for her cancer research. She had patients. She had saved their lives. They loved her. It was very evident to me personally that she took care in my well-being. We were going to cure cancer, my cancer. What distinguishes her from being a good physician to a great physician is that you know that you're in good hands. She and George met shortly after she arrived to the hospital. It seemed like a good partnership. Dr. Gonzalez Angulo and Dr. Blumenschein both had an incredible passion to search for cures for cancer. That certainly brought them closer together in both their research and in their personal lives. By 2013, the two colleagues were spending most of their time together, in and out of the lab. They went on trips together, on speaking engagements or conventions. They went to remote places I want to say Vietnam to uh, Ecuador. And in fact, not long before this all transpired, they were in Colombia on business. These people were working at least 60 hours a week, sometimes a lot more. It seems like it would have been easy to, you know, blur the lines between, you know, professional boundaries into more personal boundaries. Rumor was, that's exactly what happened. The suggestion was made by several doctors that there was more than just friendship going on. There was an incident where a colleague walked in and she was sitting on his lap in his office. It emerged that she was really flirty with him a lot of the time. 
Dr. Blimishon would call Dr. Gonzalez Angulo his little princess. They had pet names for each other. You know, he was, it was definitely a two-way street when it came to romantic mingling. The possibility of an affair might explain Anna's reluctance to talk to police. And it raises even more questions about George's girlfriend. Did Yvette Tony know that he was cheating on her? Was she angry about that? Most crimes either happen because of sex or money. And if money wasn't an issue, they were about to start looking for sex. We had to take into consideration that this could have been a scorned lover because of the parent love triangle that we had going on. Coming up, details of the affair threatened to turn the investigation upside down. He makes this sort of hospital bed confession. As George Blumenshine continues to fight for his life at MD Anderson Hospital, detectives have just learned that their victim has been living a double life for two years. But is George's affair with his research partner the reason why he was poisoned? What finally emerged was this really twisty tale of a doctor who was cheating on his girlfriend with another doctor. The police went through that and said, you know, maybe it's a vet Tony. Maybe she has found out about the affair. The more the investigators spoke to George's colleagues, the more it seemed like the worst kept secret in the hospital. Yvette has gotten a lawyer and stopped talking to police. But a few days later, detectives finally get a chance to sit down with the other woman in this alleged love triangle, Dr. Anna Gonzalez Angulo. We had a lengthy interview. I asked her about her schedule, his schedule. I asked her about them eating or drinking anything uh, while they were together and uh, what his uh, mannerisms were when she was with him for that day. She didn't provide anything that was damaging to her other than the fact that uh, she provided him coffee to drink. He didn't start displaying any symptoms until the afternoon. And by the evening, he was so intoxicated that his colleagues thought he was having a stroke. When they get around to asking her about the affair, she completely denies it. She was forthcoming about the amount of time that they spent together. She told me that they were very close friends. I asked if there was more, and she just referred to themselves as very close friends. Although Anna claims there was no affair, she's well aware of the rumors. She tells investigators that her partnership with George has caused her serious problems. She described threatening letters, there were threatening phone calls. They all had the common thread of uh, stay away from Dr. Blumenschein, uh, you're too close to him, stay away. She even indicated that there was a point where she had gone out to check her mail and uh, she was taken to the ground and punched and kicked. When the assault occurred, she called George Blumenschein and he and Yvette Tony both offered a place for her to stay. They supposedly urged her to go to the police, and she put it off for a time. The police report appears to confirm the attack. I was provided with photos of what appeared to be bruising to uh, her face and her abdomen. She described a man and a woman, both African-American, after he was poisoned, those threats and those letters suddenly became Exhibit A. This all seems to point at Yvette as a potential suspect. If she thought that there was an affair, she might be trying to get back at them. Investigators are only left with more questions. But thankfully, they're about to get some of them answered. They got word from the ICU that George was going to pull through. There was kidney damage, but he's going to survive. He doesn't say much while he's recovering in the hospital, but the detectives were able to talk to him after he was released a few weeks later. It occurred to me that interviewing him at his home or at his office wasn't the ideal or most comfortable place to uh, speak with him. So I convinced him to take a ride with me in my police vehicle. It's an unmarked vehicle, uh, just uh, something that he would have been comfortable in. 
So we went for a drive and we had a lengthy conversation. He finally provided me a definite timeline, came clean with his affair that had been going on with Anna Maria Gonzalez and Gulo. The fact that Yvette Tony had no idea that anything was going on between them. According to George, the affair had been Anna's idea. Anna Maria Gonzalez and Gulo was the one that pursued him. She was the one that reached out to him. She was the one that suggested that they work on research together, that they uh, travel to conventions together. And then things started getting a lot less professional. At first, George tried to keep their relationship professional. After all, he had a, he had a living girlfriend. But after constant temptation, he finally gave in. In 2011, Dr. Blumenshine and uh, Dr. Gonzalez Angulo began their affair. They were at a conference in Sweden together, and that's when they first started their sexual relationship. George tells detectives that he regrets his infidelity and has already told the vet about it. Dr. Blumenshine was absolutely remorseful for his actions, and he owned them. He makes this sort of hospital bed confession to his girlfriend and says, I need to tell you that I'm having an affair. And it's with Dr. Gonzalez Angulo. When investigators asked Yvette about it later, she admitted to having turned a blind eye to it. Even if Yvette knew about the affair, George insists that she would have never tried to poison him. There would have only been one person who would have tried to do that. Coming up, a jealous lover carries out her deadly plan. Dr. Blumenshine said that the coffee was incredibly sweet. <laughs> Months after the near-fatal poisoning of Dr. George Blumenshine, investigators believe they have a solid suspect. His research partner, Dr. Anna Gonzalez Angulo. This case had more twists and turns than a Rubik's Cube. To put it all together was not easy, but when you finally got it, it was crystal clear. So they've been looking at Yvette because they thought that she was jealous of Anna. But George thinks it was the other way around. George says his suspicions first began when he confided in Anna about the tragedy of Yvette's miscarriage. Her reaction was, well... I can have a baby for you. That was her first offer when uh, he provided her that information. She had told him that she could have the child in Colombia and come back and he could be the uncle. It's amazing to, to, to think that she would possibly just try to be a surrogate for them. Like, what a friend. <laughs> George declined the offer soon after. Anna began telling him that she was getting threats about their relationship. Anna Maria Gonzalez Angulo informed uh, George Blumenshine that she started receiving uh, letters and, and phone calls suggesting that she stay away from George. It was pretty clear to me what she was doing is she was threatening and harassing herself to try to drive a wedge between Dr. Blumenshine and Yvette. That strategy hadn't worked. But how much further had Anna been willing to go? George is convinced that Anna is the one that poisoned him because of the way his illness progressed over the course of the day. George Blumenshine described January 27th as being a day where he woke up in the early morning hours and the point on his agenda was to go over to Anna Maria Gonzalez's townhome, pick her up, and they would both go to the office to do research. George says Anna had something else in mind. She apparently pulled him into the bedroom where they engaged in sexual activity. Afterwards, they had breakfast, and Anna gave him a cup of coffee that tasted unusually sweet. Being a person that he spent hours with, she knew exactly how he took his coffee. He drank his coffee black, unsweetened. He takes a few sips and says, I, I can't drink it, it's too sweet. And she keeps forcing it on him, drink this coffee, it's from my homeland, it's from my homeland. She told him how special that coffee was, he could never have imagined how special it was indeed. Ethylene glycol, by nature, is very, very sweet. 
It is an age-old poison that individuals have used to harm others. This strange tale of the special coffee that's extremely sweet is surely to us it was clear that that was the, the moment that he was poisoned. Based on George's testimony, it didn't really seem like there was any other explanation. I went back and I asked him about the wine that he had drank with Yvette Tony just to rule it out. I asked him if there was any distinct sweetness to the wine. And he said no, that there wasn't. So the only thing at that point that he had consumed from the previous night to that morning was the coffee. And that was the only thing that he consumed that would have had the sweetness that ethylene glycol would have produced. Detectives theorize that when it finally became clear George would never leave his girlfriend, Anna snapped. Dr. Gonzalez Angulo knew she was losing Dr. Blumenshine. There's no doubt in my mind the affair meant way more to her than it did to him. She wanted to have a child with him. She wanted to be with him. He was living with another woman and I think sort of stringing her along. Dr. Gonzalez Angulo wanted to kill Dr. Blumenshine because if she couldn't have him, she didn't want anyone to have him. Now, they just have to find a way to prove it. We were waiting for a detailed report from the chemist. We had to establish timelines of how what he ingested would have metabolized and what the time frame would have been. When we got with the experts, and when we looked at the timeline, there was only one thing that was off. It was that coffee, and the timeline fit like a glove. The amount of time that ethylene glycol takes to metabolize in the body, that would have ruled out Yvette Tony because of the time frame where he started exhibiting the symptoms. He would have been well into metabolic acidosis and renal failure by the time that he had presented to the hospital. So the timeline does not fit at all that Yvette was the poisoner, not to mention the fact that she would have not had access to ethylene glycol from a laboratory. On May 29th, 2013, four months after George was poisoned, Anna is arrested on her way to work. I told her that she was under arrest for the aggravated assault by means of poisoning of Dr. George Blumenshine. She said that I had it all wrong, and my response to her at that point was, you can't beat science. And she dropped her head, and I believe she responded, no, you can't. Coming up, the jury hears new evidence captured by the victim himself. Some of those recordings were chilling. On September 15, 2014, the trial of 43-year-old Dr. Anna Gonzalez Angulo gets underway. She stands accused of poisoning her lover, Dr. George Blumenschein. This wasn't just a woman scorned. This was a woman scorched. She was looking for vengeance. If convicted, Anna could face up to life in prison. George's credibility definitely came into question during trial. You know, here's a man who wants to play the victim. Are you proud of what you did with the defendant? Without <laughs> no, I regret it deeply. Whether the jury liked him or did not like him wasn't the issue. The issue was you had a man, a doctor, whose maybe only fault was not being faithful to his longtime girlfriend. Despite her conflicting emotions, Yvette provides the prosecution with compelling testimony. I trusted her. I trusted him. I felt stupid. I felt betrayed. Yvette Tony provided the antidote to the jury for their hatred of Dr. Blumenshine. She would never harm this man. You could look at her and see. And she told the jury she felt like a fool for not realizing that this was going on. Yvette Tony was credible and crucial. I kept thinking to myself, you're going to make me look like a complete idiot. No one said anything to me about this. She stated that after George confessed about the affair, he also shared his suspicions about Anna. 
George City Bat, do not poke the dragon. I think she poisoned me, and I don't want to say anything until I know for certain or we have some sort of proof. They think, well, you know, we're going to just sort of PI this stuff ourselves, uh, be our own personal private investigators. So they start calling and getting her on the line to try to admit that she's done something wrong. It turned out George recorded those phone calls, and they're now played for the jury in court. Why in Christ? Will I ever hurt you? Why? Why would Yvette hurt me? I don't know. I don't know you two. I don't know what's behind you two. On the tapes, Anna tried to shift the blame to Yvette, just as she had done with the police. If I tell you that I have enough circumstantial evidence to press charges, will you believe me? Uh, no. I, will. I do. Against Yvette. Dr. Gonzalez Angulo could never provide the evidence and the supporting documentation to the claims that she made. According to the state, Anna had fabricated everything, including the claim that she was beaten. When we started looking and we looked at all the details and everything, it didn't match up. The colors of the bruising didn't match. It didn't fit that the strikes to the face occurred at the same time the strikes to the abdomen did. She beat herself up. That is what she did. It's sad, but it's true. Prosecutors argue that the toxicology report proved that Anna was the only one that could have poisoned George. We had a mountain of evidence against Dr. Gonzalez Angulo. And we had the best kind of evidence. We had science. The science proved that that he was poisoned with ethylene glycol, and it was done at a time when this coffee was administered to him. The defense doesn't agree. They argue that the science is anything but conclusive. There was evidence presented during trial that the ingestion of, of any harming substance could have occurred even the day before or the days before when Dr. Blumenschein was with the vet Tony. The defense, however, challenged the idea that Anna was as obsessed with George as he made her out to be. The affair wasn't as serious as he thought. You can see this sort of web that the prosecution spun of there being some fatal attraction. But honestly, the evidence showed just the opposite, that Dr. Gonzalez viewed that relationship incredibly casually. My understanding of the relationship was it was a mutually satisfactory sexual relationship. So I don't believe she was ever looking for something deeper. The defense also draws attention to many holes in the case against Anna, including a lack of due diligence in the investigation. There were so many issues, whether it was the scientific evidence, whether it was the lack of uh, investigation into the various suspects, um, you know, whether it was the veracity of the witnesses that the state brought. Uh, whether it was sort of the overreaching nature of the prosecution's, um, you know, very dramatic case. But what would the jury believe? After deliberating for two days, they finally reach a decision. We, the jury, find the defendant, Anna Maria Gonzalez Angulo, guilty of aggravated assault of a person with whom the defendant had a dating relationship. We asked for a lot of prison time because she had basically stolen years from Dr. Blumenshine. Dr. Blumenshine has permanent lasting kidney damage. His kidneys don't work at full capacity. He has to watch what he eats and how much he drinks, and his life expectancy is probably shorter based on uh, having the damaged kidneys. She was sentenced to 10 years in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. In her jealousy, Anna had not only hurt the man she loved, but ended a promising career as well. She cried not just for herself and her life, but maybe even more so for her parents, for her family. Had she known this would lead to this, I don't think she would have been with him. Everyone loses. Dr. Blumenstein has lost a piece of life that he can't get back, and his life is forever altered. And women all over the world have lost someone who had the ability to cure and help breast cancer.
毕竟号，我昨天拖中间上来了。Take it with a lip. 